Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Sectarian violence claims 112 lives in Myanmar. <laughs> Terrorist attack and government killings violate Syria's ceasefire as mass protests erupt. And suicide bombing targets Afghan mosques during Eid prayers. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. Myanmar's Rakhine state reports say at least 112 people have been killed in violent clashes in recent days. The latest wave of violence comes after Buddhist extremists stepped up their attacks against Rohingya Muslims. Witnesses say over 100 Muslims, including women, are among the dead. They are known as one of the world's most persecuted minorities, Rohingya Muslims a minority group in Myanmar that has suffered decades of systematic discrimination and abuse. Rohingya Muslims have lived in the country for hundreds of years, but Myanmar's government considers them as illegal immigrants from neighboring Bangladesh. Tens of thousands of them have been displaced following deadly clashes between Buddhist extremists and Rohingya Muslims back in June. Thousands of homes have also been torched. People from both sides are living in makeshift camps in Rakhine state. But reports say displaced Muslims outnumber displaced Buddhists by a very large margin. Also, witnesses say scores of Muslims have been killed in fresh attacks by the Buddhists this week alone. Myanmar's government has already been under fire for turning a blind eye on what many call a campaign of ethnic cleansing against Rohingya Muslims. The army and the police there have also been accused of targeting Rohingya Muslims through mass arrests. Ironically enough, the country's so-called democracy icon and Nobel Peace Laureate, Aung San Suu Kyi, has also been silent on the plight of the Rohingya people. Some analysts blame the international community's muted response for the ongoing atrocities against the Rohingyas. You know, hundreds of thousands of people are dying and being massacred, raped and systematically abused in front of the cameras of the international community and there is no political will to do anything. Just a handful of governments are uh, sort of trying to address this issue. But the reality is that uh, unless the international community puts the pressure that is absolutely necessary on Myanmar government uh, to stop the killing, first of all, and then recognize uh, these uh, communities who have lived there since 7th century as their citizens, indeed, they have been uh, living there long before the state was created. Um, and and the, 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 we won't see the end of this. In a sign of increasing support for Myanmar's government, the United States has recently invited the country to join a major military exercise in Thailand. The U.S. has also begun lifting sanctions on the country. What they are interested in, doing uh, trade with uh, Myanmar, they are interested in, in uh, their political and economical interests. They're not really interested about uh, the, the situation of the minorities there. Myanmar's main Islamic organizations have canceled celebrations for the four-day Eid al-Adha holidays. They are clearly disappointed with the international community's inaction and seek the backing of Muslim nations to end their plight. The Palestinian resistance movement Hamas has accused Israel of attacking a military factory in Sudan. Hamas's Prime Minister Ismail Haniyeh has condemned what he called the crime committed by Israel. He said the attack once again proves that Israel is an outlaw regime that sponsors terrorism in the region and the entire world. On midnight on Tuesday, four military planes attacked the Yarmouk factory in Sudan's capital, Khartoum. Two people were killed in the bombing as a result. Sudan has also accused Israel of being behind the attack and promised to retaliate. Israel has neither denied nor accepted the claim. Canada is urging the UN rights investigator Richard Falk to step down over his call for boycotting companies involved in Israeli settlement projects. The Canadian Foreign Minister John Barrett claims the appeal by Falk would, quote, poison the environment for peace. Barrett has described the UN expert's remarks as both offensive and unhelpful. He says Falk must either withdraw his report or resign from his position. Richard Falk had earlier called on the UN General Assembly and the civil society to boycott firms which are involved in building and maintaining Israeli settlements in occupied territories. The Israeli settlements are illegal under international law. Earlier we talked to human rights activists about Richard Falk's call for a boycott of companies involved in illegal Israeli settlement activities. 
Now, if a Richard Fogg to call for boycotts, is, it should, in many ways, the whole of the United Nations should be calling for sanctions and all kinds of uh, ways to hold Israel to account. The International Criminal Court, the Court of Justice, uh, to, to say, no, this is completely illegal by international law. But no, the settlements have, gro have grown. There's now 600,000 illegal Israeli settlers inside the West Bank and East Jerusalem. This is, a, this is a crime. This is an international crime. So for Richard Falk to advocate any companies uh, involved in, in international crimes, uh, you know, completely illegal by international law, is, is perfectly normal. It's, it's kind of what every other mainstream uh, country in the world should be doing. So, so there is nothing controversial about it. It's, it's, it's left as it is because of the world power supporting Israel. It's been left to civil society around the world to call for boycotts, divestment and sanctions. And finally, it is actually having a small impact at the higher level. South Africa has recently called to label uh, products coming from uh, the settlements in Israel. The Eid al-Adha ceasefire in Syria collapsed before it began. There were clashes and demonstrations in several areas and the Syrian president made an appearance to pray in one of the capital's mosques. Syria, its opposition and its loyalists failed the first test of the military ceasefire that did not last more than several hours. With that, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's predictions were correct, as he had expressed his lack of confidence in the ceasefire. The two sides of the conflict traded accusations for violating the Adha ceasefire, as the general leadership of the military and the armed forces issued a statement accusing armed groups of attacking some military sites and reported the number of targeted areas every hour and second. Local coordination committees documented more than 100 violations by the regime and reported a number of casualties and injuries, among them children, in a number of areas. According to the statement issued by the general leadership of the military and the armed forces, our courageous armed forces are dealing with these violations by responding to the sources of the gunfire, combating terrorist armed groups and tracking down their remnants. On the morning of Eid, Syria woke up to mass violations, especially in Deir Azur, Dara, Homs, the countryside of Damascus, and on the outskirts of Wadi al daif camp in the governorate of Idlib. The chairman of the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, Rami Abdel Rahman, noted the presence of al-Nusra front elements among the opposition fighters. The group had previously announced that it would not abide by the ceasefire. On the other hand, Sana News Agency announced a terrorist bombing was carried out with a booby-trapped car in the neighborhood of Al-Zahur in the southern part of the capital and reported a number of casualties and injuries. In a remarkable appearance, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad was seen on the official Syrian TV channel performing Eid prayers at the Al-Afram Mosque in Damascus. He was surrounded by a number of officials, most notably Foreign Minister Walid al Al-Assad seemed comfortable and was smiling as he was speaking to those sitting next to him after shaking hands with the worshippers. Meanwhile, Sheikh Walid Abdul Haq called for national unity and asked Syrians to stop attacking each other during the Eid khutbah, or speech. Anti-regime Syrians used the fragile ceasefire to take to the streets after Eid prayers. They held demonstrations calling for the downfall of the regime, especially in Dara, Aleppo, and its countryside, and the neighborhoods of Al-Hajar al-Aswad, Al-Kabun, and Jobar in Damascus, and several villages and towns in the countryside of Damascus, Idlib, and the countryside of Hama, Deir Azur, and Al-Raqqa. The British government has refused to comment on a report in the Guardian newspaper indicating London rebuffed an American request to use their military bases in Cyprus and in the Gulf in the case the U.S. decides to carry out an attack on Iran over its nuclear program. According to the paper, London relied on legal advice stating that any preemptive attack on Iran could be considered a breach of international law. 
report indicated that the Americans asked the British to allow their planes to take off from Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean and Ascension Island in the Atlantic Ocean, which are under British control, to hit nuclear facilities in Iran. Forty-one people were killed and at least another 50 were injured when a man blew himself up inside a mosque in northern Afghanistan. The explosion occurred during the early morning prayer for Eid al-Adha. The executor of the attack was donning a police uniform. It was a bloody start for the Eid al-Adha holiday in Afghanistan. A person wearing a police uniform blew himself up inside a mosque in the city of Maimana, the capital of Faryab region in the country's north. These people came for Eid prayers, but dozens of them were killed and injured. Many of the victims were government soldiers. Sources said that prominent local authorities were inside the mosque at the time of the explosion. Among them were the governor and police chief, but no officials were among the victims. It's the most violent attack in Afghanistan in months. It took place in an area that isn't among the most turbulent in the country. In Kabul, the Afghan president called on the Taliban movement to renounce violence. He did not directly hold the movement accountable for the incident in Maimana. I call on the Taliban and government opponents to halt the destruction of their country, the killing of their people, and the destruction of their mosques, hospitals, and schools, and to stop accomplishing foreign goals. Come live in honor, according to the Constitution. In any location you choose, there is a population and there are elections. Promote yourselves and win with votes. The United Nations places the responsibility for most of the civilian killings in the Afghan conflict on the Taliban. The charge is denied by the movement. However, its leader, Alamula Omar, has finally called on his fighters to avoid killing civilians. He stated that those he called the enemy are trying to pin this accusation onto the movement. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the head of the Likud party, and Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman, the head of the Israel Betenu, announced they will run on a joint list in the upcoming election under the name Likud Betenu. A new surprise was revealed by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as he announced he will run in the next election with his foreign minister Avigdor Lieberman on one list. The Likud party and the right-wing extremist Yisrael Betenu party will unite on the ballot under the name Likud Betenu. We are facing major challenges, and this is the time to unite the lines for the state of Israel. So we decided that Likud and Israel Betenu will compete under one list in the upcoming elections. The coalition comes as a result of secret negotiations between the two sides that would enable Lieberman to choose the cabinet as he wishes if Netanyahu heads the new government. The coalition that requires the approval of Likud primarily comes after polls showed the power of Likud recently declined and suggested that the Likud and Yisrael Betenu parties would receive about 47 seats in the next Knesset. Netanyahu Khashash. Netanyahu was concerned and worried about the possibility that his party may not hold the majority in the upcoming election, which would not allow him to form the new government. Polls showed that the Labour Party was able to minimize the gap between it and the Likud. This is how Netanyahu was able to promote the right-wing forces in Israel and to capture the attention of the Israeli political circle, as some are predicting this merger could unite polls such as Zippy Livni and Ehud Omer. On the other hand, the new coalition pointed to some of the policies the new government will implement if Netanyahu leads it. He doesn't only want control after the upcoming elections. He wants a government that is not subject to blackmail from outside the Likud bloc. He does not want an unstable coalition because Netanyahu wants to continue his right-wing policies without any threats from the coalition.
The coalition's most notable priority is to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons, and its agenda lacks any mention of negotiations with the Palestinians. Lieberman is the biggest winner of this coalition, and Netanyahu has a good chance of remaining in the post of prime minister, as he promotes the image of Israel as a state that is controlled by a government of war, not peace. Shireen Abu Akla, Al Jazeera, West Jerusalem. Much of the nation is abuzz with the stunning announcement last night that the Prime Minister's Likud and the Foreign Minister's Israel Batenu parties will be running on a joint ticket in the upcoming elections. The political ramifications are rippling, as are other factions who are now scrambling to deal with the new political alliance. Joining me now in the studio to discuss the large political shakeup is former editor in chief of the Jerusalem Post, Jeff Barak. Thank you so much for coming in. Hi, good evening. Right. Why, in your opinion, was this alliance formed, and who will benefit the most from the merger? I can answer the second question easier. I think Dr. Lieberman is the big winner of, of this realignment. The question as to why Prime Minister Netanyahu decided to do it is, as with many things with the Prime Minister, a mystery. It's not clear to me. I think, as Arias said in his earlier report, that the two parties running together are actually going to gather more seats in the Knesset than they would as if they were running separately. So the question is, why has Netanyahu taken in Yisrael Beitenu into the, into the Likud, which will change the party quite, quite dramatically, it will throw out the old-style Jabotinsky revisionists like Ruby Rivlin, Dan Merid, or Benny Begin, and introduce uh, Yisrael Beitenu into the Likud, who have a very authoritarian streak, who don't match the liberal democratic values that some people from the Kherut still carry with them. Do you believe that Netanyahu may be alienating some of the longtime Likud party activists by adopting Lieberman, who tends to have a brand of fighting religion and state? Oh, I think he'll be alienating a lot of people. There are different sectors within the Likud for whom this move is not very comfortable. As you mentioned, there's the religious uh, voters of, of the Likud. They certainly will be turned off by, by Lieberman. Those of a Mizrahi of Sephardi origin might be tempted to move to, move to Shas, for example. Others might go to the uh, Bayat Ayudi and the National Religious Party. And then, of course, as, as I mentioned earlier, there's people like Dan Meridor, Miki Eitan, Benny Begin, who talk about the values of Kherut, of the importance of liberal democracy, the importance of the other, respecting of uh, civil rights, the Arab-Israeli minority, which are things that uh, Mr. Lieberman certainly is not very strong on. And yet Lieberman's Israel Batenu party has promoted, let's say, a platform of civil rights in the sense of the last election they promised to institute civil marriage, of course. Now, do you think it's possible at all that some of the centrist population, the constituency, may be attracted toward Likud if Netanyahu, for example, is he trying to signal that he may be accepting some of these, these reforms? No, I think not. I think by merging with uh, Yisrael Beitenu, I think uh, the Prime Minister is signaling very, very sharply that he's moving to the right. I mean, let's not forget, you've had the Prime Minister in the past go to the United Nations, talk about peace, talking about wanting to negotiate uh, with the Palestinians, and the following day, the Foreign Minister, Mr. Lieberman, goes to the United Nations and says the Prime Minister's talking rubbish, which, first of all, is unbelievable this can happen in the country, but okay, it happens. But what was the Prime Minister's response until now? It's that what Mr. Lieberman says doesn't represent the government. Now the very fact that he's brought Yisrael Beitenu into the Likud, he can no longer use that excuse. So I think what we're seeing is Mr. Netanyahu shifting very, very sharply to the right. The Al-Aqsa Foundation for Endowment and Heritage warned of calls made by Jewish organizations to perform mass Jewish prayers in the Al-Aqsa Mosque starting on the next Hebrew month. This reveals the excessive amount of Judaization inside the Holy City. Scenes like this one are now familiar and ever-present in the courtyards of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It does not move the consciousness of the international community or the Arab consciousness that is preoccupied by its internal worries. The scene in the surroundings of Jerusalem is now very distorted. Extremist groups violate all sanctuaries and call for dividing Al-Aqsa Mosque, the first Qibla, forecasting a demonstration of thousands in the next few days. 
The excavation under the mosque is part of several steps that were followed and implemented by extremist Zionist settler organizations and Benjamin Netanyahu's government and the governments that preceded it. On the other hand, the ground under Al-Aqsa is in a race against time, as the excavations are continuing in search of a temple that does not exist except in the minds of extremist groups. What these pictures reveal is the scale of these excavations that were described as the largest in 150 years. Here a city underground is shown being excavated by Jewish extremist groups that purposely distort historic facts by linking the site to Jewish history that has no trace on our land. There are excavations that are happening now from the Damascus Gate to Al-Barak Wall, and the purpose is to steal the ruins and stones from these areas and to plant them in distant areas for the Jews to claim as part of their heritage. Israel also wants to prove to the world that these ruins date back to the era of King David and not to the Arab Islamic era. In light of the internal concerns of Arab capitals, Jewish groups are openly talking about a historic chance to fulfill their ominous dream of establishing the so-called temple on the rubble of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. In Lebanon, Member of Parliament Walid Jumblat said he will not withdraw his ministers from the cabinet despite a request by the leader of the future movement, Saad al-Hariri, to do so after the assassination of Brigadier General Wissam al-Hassan. These statements come as opposition forces calling for the downfall of the government of Najib Makati began a campaign to clarify their stance through diplomatic meetings following international warnings that Lebanon could slip into a political vacuum if the government resigns. In white clothes, they walked in the streets of Beirut to express their rejection of the clash between the March 14th and the March 8th forces. They are civil society activists who say they represent the silent Lebanese majority that can no longer bear the results of severe political alliances. There must be a third option aside from the propositions of the March 8th and March 14th coalitions. We only witness political bickering, nonsensical speeches, and an ongoing escalation of violence, sectarianism, and destruction. However, the first days of Eid al-Adha fell a week after the assassination of Brigadier General Wissam al-Hassan in an explosion that impacted the delicate political balance of the country. This reality was present during the Eid sermons. We can never allow a government to be overthrown into the street. We didn't allow it yesterday, we haven't allowed it for years, and we will never allow such an overthrow. Member of Parliament Walid Jambalot, who holds the balance of power between opposition and loyalist forces, clinged to this position by announcing that he won't withdraw his ministers from the cabinet in fear of a vacuum during what he described as a regional storm. International and regional parties that disagree on events in Syria seem to agree that there could be no change in the region before the kind of change that will take place in Syria is made clear. But the opposition didn't succumb to international concerns about the dangers of a political vacuum. It started a campaign of diplomatic meetings to clarify its position. We demand the resignation of this government and quick planning in accordance with the Constitution so that the caretaker government can conduct its functions in order to avoid a vacuum. Meanwhile, the March 14th forces are pushing for the activation of their sit-in in front of the government building to bring down the cabinet. Between one crisis and another, the country reaches the edge of this abyss and doesn't fall. The Lebanese are quite familiar with this reality since all days of the year seem similar, with or without Taid. al Asi, Al Jazeera, Beirut.
احتفل المسلمون في مختلف أنحاء العالم سواء في الدول العالم الإسلامي. Muslims all over the world, whether in the world's Islamic countries or Muslim communities residing in non-Islamic countries, celebrated the first day of the blessed Eid al-Adha today. The Eid prayer was held in occupied Jerusalem amid a gathering by thousands of Muslims in the Aqsa Mosque and the surrounding squares. Eid prayer was also held in the West Bank, with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas sitting in the front row. Worshippers in the Gaza Strip prayed behind deposed Prime Minister Ismail Haniya. In Cairo and other cities, Eid prayer was held as Muslims flocked to squares and mosques to perform Eid prayers this morning. Preachers asked the Almighty God for peace and unity to reign among the people of the two nations, the Arab and Islamic. In Indonesia, the country celebrated the Holy Eid al-Adha, while Muslims celebrated in the Philippines, Bangladesh, Yemen, Afghanistan, Russia, and many other nations. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.